Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak today. So I will be talking about interferons in myeloproliferative neoplasms. Um, so I'm sure everyone in the room is aware by now, but just wanted to start with the background with the myeloproliferative neoplasms, or MPNs, which are blood cell disorders that are characterized by increased blood counts, essential thrombocythemia with increased platelets, polycythemia vera with increased red cells, myelofibrosis, which is primarily characterized by scarring in the bone marrow. Um, so interferons are used more in ET and PV, so the rest of the talk is really going to focus more on interferons in the context of ET and PV. So these are the main disease complications in ET and PV. There are a few more uh, relevant complications, but I think these are the three main things that come up uh, when um, I see patients. Um, so most of our treatments within ET and PV are to prevent blood clots, and that includes blood clots that can develop in the legs, which are deep vein thromboses, and these clots can travel to the lungs as pulmonary emboli. Um, most of the blood clots actually occur in the arteries, and those include strokes and heart attacks. And actually, um, thrombosis and cardiovascular events are the most common contributor to morbidity and mortality within ET and PV. And this is something that our treatment strategies can actually reduce. Um, so this is a big focus within the management of ET and PV. But I also think that what patients often have the most anxiety about is the risk of progression. Overall, the risk of progression is lower in um, uh, ET and PV, probably about you know, 5 to 10 percent on, on, on average for, for ET and PV patients to myelofibrosis and less than 5 percent to acute leukemia. But um, as, sort of that was, as we sort of mentioned earlier today, most of our treatments are not definitively known to change that risk of progression, and I, and I think that causes a lot of anxiety. And finally, we've had a nice talk today as well about symptoms, um, which can also occur in ET and PV. And I think that's an important aspect of care when we're considering different treatments um, and the side effects that, that um, different treatments can, can bring. So I think it's helpful before speaking about um, interferons, just sort of um, backing up and looking at the overall management strategies within ET and PV. So as I mentioned, all our treatments are directed at reducing the risk of blood clots. And so when we talk about risk stratification within ET and PV, we're talking about the risk of having blood clots, not risks of disease progression. Um, and so, um, for the most part, we divide patients into low-risk and high-risk categories. Unfortunately, our risk stratification scores are not super sophisticated, but um, uh, in general, the lower-risk patients are those who are younger and have never had a blood clot. And these patients, an antiplatelet agent is generally used, um, and we don't necessarily need additional medications, and for PV patients, um, therapeutic phlebotomy to keep the hematocrit less than 45% is recommended. And higher risk patients who are older with a JAK2 mutation or have ever had a history of a blood clot, in addition to an antiplatelet agent, we generally recommend some sort of medication to optimize uh, the blood counts. And so these are the, the cytoreductive agents um, that are listed in the NCCN guidelines that are used for uh, first line treatments in ET and PV. I think most people are very familiar with hydroxyurea. This is by far the most popular drug that's used, and that's because uh, it's a drug we have a lot of experience with, a lot of data for its safety. It's, it's a pill, it's cheap, um, uh, and, it's, and it's pretty well tolerated. I think most people don't have a lot of side effects, um, um, if any, when they start taking the hydroxyurea. So hydroxyurea basically works by um, inhibiting um, cell division. So uh, you know your blood cells have to divide very frequently in order to, to make all the, the cells in, in your blood. Um, and so hydroxyurea will uh, uh, basically drop your blood counts by making your, your cells not divide as frequently. And so uh, we see uh, that it acts on all the different cell lines. Uh, so your white cells, your red cells, and your platelets will all go down with hydroxyurea. Um, and that's different than something like anagrelide for ET, which um, is, it only works on the platelets because it specifically inhibits uh, the platelet maturation. The interferons are also listed as first-line uh, agents in the NCCN guidelines, and there's been a lot more interest in the use of interferons recently uh, because of a question mark of whether or not it can actually modify the disease or, or change the disease course. 
So first off, what are the interferons? So interferons are uh, a type of signaling protein that are part of the immune system. Uh, they are released by cells in response to viral infections, and the name actually comes from the fact that it interferes with, uh, with viral replication. And um, it was one of the first immune therapies that was actually used um, for cancers. Uh, it's not used as often in a, in a lot of the different um, hematologic cancers and infections like hepatitis B or C um, because, it's, uh, because other drugs have come, uh, come along, but it, it does have approvals for a variety of different treatments. And um, it's only more recently have become, has become popular because in the past, interferons had to be administered very frequently. You had to inject it uh, multiple times a week, and as a result, it caused a lot of side effects, and it wasn't very well tolerated. However, recently, interferons have been used more for MPN treatments because um, we've been able to pegylate the interferons. And that means you add a, a molecule to the drug so that it lasts longer in your body. And if it lasts longer in your body, you don't have to administer it as frequently, and then you also get fewer side effects. Um, and so now the drug is a lot more tolerable, and we can actually take it to treat the disease. So how do interferons work in the MPNs? So this is something that's under intense study, and I think it's not entirely clear, and there's likely multiple ways that uh, interferons are thought to work. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, so I wanted to first back up and just sort of frame the NPNs as overall caused by uh, mutations that occur in the uh, hematopoietic stem cell. Um, so the main mutations are JAK2, CalR, and MIPL. Um, and your stem cells are your precursor cells that eventually will become um, your mature white cells, red cells, and your platelets. And a mutation will occur in one of these early stem cells and then sort of get propagated forward in all your mature blood cells. Um, and how the interference, or one of the appealing ways that interference are thought to work is that it's actually thought to preferentially act on the mutated stem cell as opposed to the non-mutated stem cell, such that over time, the mutated stem cells become um, preferentially depleted or exhausted. Um, and so the pool of mutated, of, uh, the pool of stem cells with that mutation will actually go down relative to the stem cells that don't have the mutation. And so that's a very appealing way that interference are thought to work uh, because at its core, NPNs are a stem cell disorder, and that's very different from something like hydroxyurea, which is just supposed to work because it lowers all your blood counts. Um, so we've been fortunate in that recently there's been some randomized control trials that have directly compared interferons to hydroxyurea, the two main treatments used um, in ET and PV, and so we're able to see um, sort of how they, how they look head to head. Um, so this study is the MPDRC-112 study, this randomized um, high-risk ET and PV patients. So by definition, all these patients needed some sort of medication to control their blood counts. And patients were randomized to two arms, um, either pegylated interferon or hydroxyurea. And the main thing that the investigators were interested in was looking at the complete responses at one year. So complete response is defined as platelets less than 400, hematocrit less than 45% without the use of therapeutic phlebotomy, a white count of less than 10, and resolution of an enlarged spleen or any disease-related symptoms. And the main takeaway of the trial was that for complete responses, so basically control of blood counts, hydroxyurea and pegylated interferon were equivalent to one another. So there didn't seem to be any difference in how well blood counts were controlled at one year, whether you're on hydrea or pegylated interferon. However, the investigators also looked at mutation responses, so basically looking at the, the levels of JAK2 um, in, in the bone marrow. Um, and what the investigators found was that at one year, again, there are no significant differences whether you're on hydrea or pegylated interferon with your JAK2 levels, although they noticed that at two years, the pegylated interferon arm did have significantly, uh, a significantly lower JAK2 levels. Um, and it seemed that with more time with treatment, the JAK2 levels would continue to decline when treated with pegylated interferon, whereas this didn't seem to be the case with hydroxyurea. So on the top figure right here, I don't think you can see my cursor, um, but on the top figure right there, you can see the um, patient responses. Each bar is sort of the best uh, response in JAK2, whether or not you're treated with hydrea or pegylated interferon. And you can see in the peg, uh, pegylated interferon arm, there are some patients who had a very uh, marked drop in their JAK2 levels uh, with um, pegylated interferon treatment, whereas responses to hydrea were, were much more measured. 
Um, a similar trial, the Dahlia trial, uh, briefly, well, for, for all intents and pur purposes, randomized uh, patients uh, with ET, polycythemia vera, there are some myelofibrosis and prefibrotic myelofibrosis patients, uh, to hydroxyurea in two different brands of pegylated interferon, and similarly, their primary endpoint was looking at um, clinical hematologic responses, um, looking at blood count responses. Um, and very similarly, at one year and two years, there's no significant differences between the three arms. So uh, both, uh, both pegylated interferon and hydrea seem to, to be very similar in terms of its effectiveness in controlling the, the blood counts. Um, the Dahlia investigators also looked at genomic profiling before, uh, before treatment and then after two years of treatment. Um, and with pegylated interferon, the JAK2 levels did seem to decline. And um, if you had a, a JAK2 decrease, you were also more likely to have a hematologic response with pegylated interferon. Very interestingly enough, the CalR levels do not seem to change as much with pegylated interferon treatment. And that's not to say that um, interferons don't work in CalR mutated patients. CalR mutated patients can still have good blood count responses with, um, with interferon, but it does suggest the mechanism of action that interferons are thought to work in MPN patients is different if you have a CalR mutation um, versus a JAK2 mutation. And finally, sort of the newest um, pegylated interferon is ROPEG interferon. Um, so this drug is a little bit different in that it's a monopegylated interferon. Um, that basically gives the interferon an even longer half-life, um, so you only have to administer it every other week as opposed to weekly, and that should result in better tolerability as well. So the PROUD PV Conti trial randomized adult PV patients to either ROPEG interferon ver versus hydroxyurea, and similarly, they were interested in looking at complete, uh, complete hematologic responses and also improvements in splenomegaly. So most, most patients did not have any baseline spleen enlargements, so these, this data right here is just showing the hematologic uh, responses and the molecular responses below. Um, so similar to the other trials that were shown, um, at one year, the, uh, the percent hematologic responses were similar if you were treated with a ROPEG interferon versus hydroxyurea, but you can see that as time goes on, um, the hematologic response rate seems to be better if you're treated with ROPEG compared to um, hydrea. Um, the uh, investigators also looked at the molecular responses, so this is defined as at least a 50% decline um, in your uh, driver mutation burden. Um, again, at one year, no significant differences in the arm, but you can see that as you extend follow-up, the percentage of molecular responses was significantly better um, with ROPEG interferon compared to hydroxyurea. So overall, if we were to summarize those trials, um, it, it suggests that with the interferons and hydrea, with blood count control, they're pretty uh, uh, similar to one another, um, except for ROPEG, which seemed to have better hem hematologic responses with time. However, it does seem that the interferons um, do have a positive impact on decreasing the mutation burden, especially as time goes on, which is something that we would not expect um, hydroxyurea to do. Um, so this has led to some discussion among MPN experts in that if we are able to decrease the mutation burden, particularly um, the JAK2 levels, um, does this mean we're modifying the disease? Does this mean that we should be uh, using interferons over hydrea? Does this mean we should be treating low-risk patients with interferons? And I think even though the data is pretty exciting, unfortunately, it's still a little bit too early to tell. So we don't know for sure if decreasing your JAK2 levels over time means that you're decreasing the risk of progression or you're having that, you know, quote, disease modification. The only way we would know that for sure is if we were to fall out over time all these patients on these clinical trials and actually see, do we see differences in the rates of progression in each arm? And unfortunately, that's going to take a long time and many patients. Um, and so at this point, we, we don't have what we call a good surrogate for, for what it means to actually uh, uh, change the disease long term. Um, and so I think it's a little bit too early right now to be changing sort of the consensus guidelines for how we approach ET and PV. Although I will say that because of some of this data, I do tend to favor using interferons in younger patients um, that need cytoreduction. Although I don't necessarily just start interferon treatments on every patient that I see. But I think before you, you think about, well, um, 
the benefits of interferon. I think it's also important to, to understand the side effects and, and what's it like taking it. Um, it is a subcutaneous injection. Um, uh, it can be given weekly for, for uh, Pegasus um, or every other week with Ropeg. Um, there are some patients who have, uh, if you have a good uh, response to these drugs, you can start spacing out how frequently you give the interferons. So the label for Ropeg allows you to administer it up to every month if you get good control of your blood counts with time. Um, it can cause some um, flu-like side effects and malaise, uh, particularly when you first uh, get started, um, and often that improves and you can pre-medicate with Tylenol. Um, and it, the effects are very slow. So if you remember in the trials, we didn't really see any benefits until uh, two years, three years. Um, and that's partly because you have to start at a very low dose and then you sort of ramp up to the therapeutic dose. But um, the full benefits of this drug can take weeks to months. Um, and other adverse effects, it, it will lower your blood counts, which is in general what we want for ET and PV patients since counts are high. It can cause fatigue and malaise, as I mentioned before. It can cause liver test abnormalities and that has to be monitored throughout. And because this is an immunomodulatory drug, um, it can cause some autoimmune manifestations such as hypothyroidism. Um, and patients who have an autoimmune disorder, they may not be the best candidates for, uh, for this drug. Um, sort of one of the unique side effects of the interferons is that it can cause worsening of depression. And so if somebody has a very significant psychiatric history, interferons might not be the best drug to take. And overall, across the trial, the discontinuation rates were about 5 to 10 percent. I think the Dahlia trial had much higher discontinuation rates, but um, overall, uh, probably similar to, to hydroxyurea. Um, so this slide here just summarized some of the advantages and, and disadvantages of hydroxyurea versus pegylated interferon. I think um, one of the main advantages of hydrea is that it, we, have, we just have so much experience with it. It's, it's cheap. It's easy to take. It's just a pill. It's very well tolerated. Um, I would say the majority of my patients don't feel any different when they're on it um, uh, compared to when they're off of it. Um, although it does have a few side effects, it, it can interfere with wound healing, um, and it does increase the risk of non-melanomous skin cancers. Um, and we know that it offers good control of blood counts, which in turn decreases the risk of blood clots. Um, I think the major cons, we know that it doesn't provide disease modification, and it can also cause birth defects with pregnancy, so it is contraindicated in pregnancy, um, and that is an important consideration for women of childbearing age um, who, might, who might need cider reduction. The pros with the interferons is that we see that it can decrease the mutation burden with time, and we're still trying to understand what that means um, long term. Um, it offers just as good control of blood counts as hydroxyurea. Um, and, you know, I think overall it is well tolerated, um, although I think the side effect profile is just a little bit different. Um, it can cause more liver test abnormalities, malaise, uh, um, depression. And this is the treatment of choice in pregnancy because uh, it is not known to be teratogenic. And so if a pregnant woman needs cytoreduction, reduction, we would give them interferons. Um, I think the main cons is that, you know, it is more expensive. Uh, it's an injection, which some people really might not like, and it takes a long time to work. Um, and I think one of the main, other main cons is, especially within the community, um, some physicians just might not have as much experience with it um, and might not be as... Uh, familiar with giving it, whereas, you know, uh, everybody's pretty much uh, familiar with, with prescribing hydroxyurea. Um, so this is where the interferons fit in with the current NCCN guideline recommendations for ET and PV. Um, so within PV, uh, ROPEG interferon does have a label for both low-risk and high-risk PV. Um, and so in low-risk patients, uh, in addition to therapeutic phlebotomy, ROPEG interferon is an other recommend, recommended regimen. And in high-risk PV patients, um, hydrea, pegasus are preferred regimens, and ROPEG is an other recommended regimen. Within um, consensus guidelines in general, low-risk ET patients do not necessarily need cider reduction, but in high-risk uh, patients, uh, pegylated interferon um, and anagrelite are, are, are other recommended regimens, and hydrea is, is listed as a preferred regimen. Um, those are sort of the guidelines, sort of how I think about interferon use in patients, is that it's, it is sort of individualized. I don't use it too much in myelofibrosis, and I still think it's, it's too early to say that everyone should be treated with this. So I think in low-risk patients, it's very reasonable to treat 
uh, with aspirin and then therapeutic phlebotomy alone if, if, uh, if you have PV. I do tend to recommend interferons in younger patients, though, if they need cider reduction, especially uh, women of, of childbearing age. And there are many things that I think you need to consider when deciding um, a drug. Um, you know, patient comorbidities is very important. I think there are a few comorbidities that would make me really uh, decide against interferons, such as a significant psychiatric history or an autoimmune disorder. Uh, cost might be a, a, a factor as well. If, if you don't have insurance, for instance, then you, know, you probably would need to be on hydroxyurea. Um, because the interferons take a very long time, um, hydro hydroxyurea is often used up front to sort of bring down your blood counts quickly, and often you can bridge the hydrea and the interferon um, so that you start off with both and then peel off the hydrea as your counts um, get better. Um, I think patient preferences too. I mean, there are some patients who really don't want an injection, although one could argue an every other week injection versus a pill you take every day. It, a patient might feel differently about that. And some patients might feel very strongly about doing everything they can to, to possibly modify their disease, and so they want to take their interference. And then finally, uh, patient symptoms are also important. Um, as was sort of uh, mentioned earlier, I, I don't really think of either hydrea or pegylated interferon as necessarily uh, you know, being helpful with, or very, very helpful with um, decreasing symptoms, and sometimes we might be trading off symptoms with, with side effects. Um, so that's also an important consideration as well. Um, so this is just my summary slide about what I talked about, um, sort of overall how we think about treating ET and PV and, and where the interferons are. I think there's been a lot of renewed interest in, in using um, this in, um, in ET and PV, although we're still sort of figuring out you know, how it works and sort of the implications of, of its use. Um, and ultimately, I do want to emphasize that I think it's very much a personalized decision um, that, that you need to talk to with, uh, with your provider.